is Boxing Tickets NA in association with Alan Gentleman. And we're absolutely honoured and delighted to welcome the one and only Wayne the Pocket Rocket McCulloch. How are you, Wayne? Doing good, just getting the end of the summer, summer heat in Las Vegas, although it's warm the whole year, more or less, but end of the, the probably 45 and 46 Deltas. <laughs> Weather we can only dream of here in Belfast. Yeah, well, here, you know, it's like back home, you get that one week of weather and the t-shirts are off and you're sitting outside the pubs drinking. And then by the end of the night, they're all roasted red. <laughs> and complaining about it the next day as well. So here, I've been here, I've been here for like 20 years. I've had, a, I've had a tan since I've been here. You know what I mean? It's just so warm all, all the time. It's nice. And then I'm a, I'm a brown man now. <laughs> <laughs> you're, de- you're, definitely, you're definitely well used to weather then. And I guess obviously it's good to hear that you still obviously call here home, even though you've been in America for quite a bit as well. So it's probably refreshing for people to hear that you probably still regard Northern Ireland as your home, which obviously it always has been. Um, Definitely. Northern Ireland will be my home. I was born born and raised in Belfast, and it's my home forever. And and I I know I grew up doing it bad times, but, you know, my daughter was born here. She's 23 years old and she knows you know, the history of our, our country and stuff and loves it. She actually loves it. She loves it. She loves the food for some reason. Why? <laughs> it's just about di- stuff that it's a bit different to the super size stuff you probably get in a lot of places in America nowadays. You get one plate over here and that's it. That's right. Man. It's everything, everything's big over here. You know, everything's big. The Americans are tall as well. <laughs> <laughs> big skyscrapers. Um, Obviously, as we, we always like to do, anybody that comes on for the first time, you're obviously um, a Hall of Fame um, fighter, obviously, so Olympic silver medalist, the fir- first WBC world champion from obviously Ireland. I think the only one still, probably to this the stage. Only, it's, it's, only male, only male. Kitty Taylor got the belt. Yeah. Um, only male. But for obviously some of the younger viewers that probably know the name and maybe seen some clips of you, we always like to go back to the backstory for fighters and, you know, probably times of obviously whenever you're growing up here and things like that so obviously it feels like probably feel like a long time ago now but what age did you start out boxing and, and why was obviously was it probably as I guess I always like to say for me growing up probably learning karate or boxing or thing like that was like self-defense was it sort of a reason you got into boxing obviously growing up in Belfast be able to defend yourself or why did you get into boxing? I got into Belfast or in boxing in the boxing my two brothers Alan and Noel, one's five years old, one's six years older. They started boxing when I was, I was a kid, you know what I mean? They were, they were younger. And then um, my brother Noel brought him a small e trophy about this size, and I thought, I want one of them. <laughs> but you know, in, in school, I was doing cross country running, and um, I played in a football team through primary school um, through secondary school. And I love football, I played in the streets all the time as well. But when I, I went to start to go to boxing, I was about seven years old when I first went to boxing, the Albert Foundry gym. And um, I sort of just watched people and stood at the, the back and jump rope and um, sort of watched things, sort of try to pick things up. And then um, I got my first fight with about eight. I just became natural to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was good at football because we all play football in the streets and we all think we're, we all think we're Jordy Bates or something. I mean, but, but we're not as good as him. <laughs> There's no team that could say they are better than Jordy no, Bates. Even to get, even getting to get into the, to get into the Premier League or anything, even, you know, getting the, the Irish League, you have to be decent football player, you know, and, and I was, I could have pursued it long, but I didn't, and the boxing just came, I say, came natural. Once I started fighting at 80 years old, you know, I was winning fights, and sometimes you lose a fight one here and there, but by the time I was 12, I had probably about 100 fights or something, but so I knew that, I knew, sort of, I still was doing the football and stuff, but I just thought, I'm good at this, you know, I was better at it, and I say, it was at Albert Fernie, which is walking distance from Highfield Estate. Mm-hmm. And that's the only reason why I went there, because it was just, you walk across the street, across the football pitch at the gym. <laughs> but it did, it, a lot of it to do was, it did keep me out of trouble as well. You know, growing up, in, I was born in Shanga Road, actually, in Percy Street, in the house. And then we, I think we moved out to, like, Craig Avon for, like, a year, and then I moved back to Highfield Estate. But um, that's a suburb of the Shanga. And a lot of, you've seen a lot of stuff going on, a lot of shootings and bombs and stuff, and mm. you know paramilitary stuff. And and I always just thought going to the gym every night sort of kept me out of trouble. And I say I went to the gym with my friends first, then we sort of dwindled away. Where you know I liked it, and they didn't really like it. 
but then I say the troubles, you know, we're at the 70s and 80s, we're at the height at the height. Mm-hmm. And I say by the time I was seven, I was 77. And then I say every day with like bombs going off shootings, and I just thought there's got to be something better than this. I'm proud of where it comes from, but mm-hmm. what's it all about? You know what I mean? And and boxing sort of was that one way ticket out. Have you made it? Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I wanted to get out because I if everybody knows me and my colleague. Um, I never wanted to leave Belfast. The truth, I was a home bird of the Irish team. I didn't want to leave. And all of a sudden, I, that's a 360 turn right around and I ended up in Las Vegas. You know, so as I say, I was a home bird and didn't want to leave Belfast, but for some reason I was brought here. It's, it's funny, obviously, how, how life works out in different ways. You know, where you're saying you're a home bird and, and not one to leave, and then all of a sudden, opportunities arise and you can't turn down, you know, once in a lifetime sort of opportunities that come across. And, you know, if you if you probably look back now and you go, if I didn't go to America, would you would you even have, have obviously achieved what you achieved as a boxer? You know, it's... Yeah, wouldn't it? You know, it's people sometimes make the leap and they go, another chance will come. If another chance doesn't come, then you know where to go. Yeah, no, when, uh, the truth is, on my wall here, this is my small gym here. And Eddie, Eddie Fudge is the reason why I came to Las Vegas. Eddie Fudge, you know, say even the, the younger generation of boxers don't really know who he is today. Mm-hmm. But I would say, you know, he, he trained like Joe Frazier and Ken Norton, Leon Spinks, and um, the three guys that beat Muhammad Ali. Ali offends the losses, but Joe Frazier beat Ali when he was undefeated and Ali was undefeated. And then when Joe Frazier and Ali fought for the second, third time, Ali already lost to Norton and Spinks, and, and George already beat Frazier. So they weren't undefeated guys the second and third. So it was a big win. So when I say that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember Joe Frazier. I don't remember that. I don't even know Eddie, Eddie which, is, which is fine because was, there was no social media when Eddie was around. <laughs> and Eddie, Eddie lived, he was, he lived, he was 90 in 2001. And, and when I came here in 93, he was 80, 82 years old. And as I say, he's the reason why I became champion of the world. And I got the short cap for Riddick Bowe and Michael Callum. And it was like the Irish league player going straight to the Premier League. Mm. Are they going to turn it on? Are they going to stay? No, they're going to go. <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, you you only get Norman get... Whiteside and all. They all did it. They all went run away, and you can always go back, but let them stay away. Exactly, and it's, it's for the better opportunities and things. Like, like obviously having a hundred fights by the time you're twelve, probably the landscape of boxing is probably changing nowadays. Where we're probably seeing boxers coming through with very little amateur experience. You know. Obviously, I think more recently, was it Lawrence O'Coley? I think it like 20, 20 fights as an amateur. You know, he's at 16 fights as a professional. So I think all in his 40 odd fights, and he's a world champion boxer as well. Is, is it strange for you in a way where you see not so much of a landscape of amateur boxing where they're happy to go in, in easier? Does that probably show the standard of boxing has probably went down? Well, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying you have to have 100 fights or 200 fights. I just love to fight, you know what I mean? And back in the day in, the, in Belfast, and, you know, the amateur system was good. You could, fought, you could have fought every week. You know, and then when you went to the, like the boys' club championship, to the, the, the Ulsters of the, the, you know, the juniors and, and all Ireland and stuff, you, you could have fought three, three times a week. Mm-hmm. You no, know, so you, you go to the Ulsters, you fight three times, you go to the country Island three, three times, go to the all Ireland three times. There's, there's nine fights within a month, probably. <laughs> you know, so that's the way it was back then. I, I know as the, just before I came here, then it was almost like you were only getting one fight, maybe two fights in a month. So I think boxing was more popular when I was growing up. There was more people. If you went to the county anthem, you have to win three fights to win it. It's like that's only the county anthems. Mm-hmm. Then you get to go to the Ulsters, and then after you fight three there, and then the All Ireland. So I say then you had to do that. Now it's like you make it a walkover. You know, county anthems, you make it one fight, and then go to the Ulster, get one, and then go to the All Ireland, maybe get two at the most. So I think the dynamics of boxing have changed and, and uh, it's still pretty popular. I think in, around in the pro game back in Ireland is, is popular because when I, when I was turning pro, you know, I thought I was going to stay home. But, you know, you had Dave Boy, was at the end of his career. And, um, you know, you Eamon Lochran, he was a world champion, he was there and, and stuff. But Eamon McGee and all them guys were still knocking him out. But there was really not much happening. You know, Barney Eastwood was really the only guy, mm-hmm. the only promoter at the time. And, um, and, and his gym, John Breen and stuff. 
But as I say, I didn't sign with Barney and I, I thought I would have, but it didn't work out. But I'm always grateful to Barney Eastwood for, he let me use his gym along with my brother who was sparring pros and I got to spar with world champions there. So I'm always grateful to Barney. And then after that, I left and then the Barney was, was I think, up at the end of him. Mm-hmm. And he sort of dwindled away from boxing. So he, I think Barney Eastwood was the one keeping boxing life, professional boxing. Because he used to have a card every month in the Ulster Hall and then maybe every twice a year in the Kings Hall. So I don't think boxing's down. I just think it's sort of, there's more pros. And they say they, they go from amateur to pro. It's a big leap. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as I say, you don't have to have 200 fights to go there. The Cubans... And like the Russians and all back in the day, they, they could probably have 400 fights, amateur fights, but, but they never went pro. Mm-hmm. But now like, days like Casimir, who I fought in the big final, he defected and came here, became world champion. He had as many fights as I did in the amateurs, no I mean, over 300. So, and they became world champion. So you can still have a lot of fights and still keep yourself fresh as well. Because at that point, when you have that many fights, you know how to defend yourself. Not a lot better, but then somebody with 50 fights, but just sort of more ex- experience. You can't buy experience, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um, as I say, but fighters can have 20 fights to turn pro. Some guys, there's a guy in my gym who sparred with my my fighter, Larry Friars, the Irish guy. And this kid is 21 years old, never fought a fight in his life. And we're, we're trying to get, turn him pro right away, but we're, we're going to have to probably give him one or two amateur fights first. Mm-hmm. But he could go straight to pros. You know, there's a couple of world champions never even fought one pro amateur fight, and they're and they've been um, a world champion. Just so people people take it a different, you know, probably somebody just naturally talented and take everything like a, like a sponge and probably probably more sometimes a fear of getting hit probably stops from actually getting hit and making sure yeah. they're always the, the their, their gloves are the ones that's hitting rather than receiving. Yeah, well, think if you're going to go, go to professional boxing, I'd say if you've had some experience in a ring, it doesn't have to be a boxing ring, it could be karate, it could be kickboxing, it could be jiu-jitsu, it could be anything. But having that fighting experience and going to professional boxing, I think it'd sort of be okay. But without that any experience, it'd be tough, I think. You know what I mean? So I think having some experience in the ring, just getting hit up the head or, or kicked up the head or something, whether it be, I'd be punched up the head. <laughs> ah, exactly. <laughs> but, Feeling the force no, of a kick. A little bit of experience there, you know what I mean, from that. And, and, and um, sort, of, sort of then going, going back, obviously, um, you know, 18 years of age, um, Going to obviously the Olympic Games, you're actually you had to the honour of being the, the flag carrier for the Irish team as well. And obviously, when you look back in moments of your boxing career, I'm sure it's probably one of your your proudest moments. You know, 18 years of age, probably you look at 18 year olds nowadays, and they probably someone could even tie their shoelaces. But you were obviously <laughs> you were there, sort of like a face face of Ireland and, and carrying the flag in the Olympic Games. I'm sure it was a proud moment for you. What are you trying to say, I was a man? <laughs> I thought I was a man. The truth is, that year, I was 16 and 87, turned 17 that year in 87. And Olympics were 88. So that was the year to go for a run for, you know what I mean? Because I was mm-hmm. 16 night the year before. I just won the, the Irish Youth. But then I entered the Irish under 18s, won them. And then at the end of um, 87, I won the Irish Juniors. And then in February of March of 88, I won the All Irelands. Ulsters and senior and Ulsters and Irish all Ireland. So I was, I was 16, just turned 17, and I won four Irish championships within nine months from youth, under 18, junior, and a senior. And I knocked everybody out. <laughs> and I weighed, I weighed seven and a half stone. And um, that year was the Olympic year. So I knocked out the um, PJ O'Halloran, who became my good friend, and the All Ireland seniors. And as I say, they, they did a box off with them a few months, a few weeks later, and I stopped them again. <laughs> and then that year, the big year they won, because the junior, the junior, I think it was the junior European for coming up as well that year. And I never traveled like at the senior level to my first competition at the senior level was Seoul, Korea. <laughs> Unbelievable. But the day after the All Ireland, the, the Ulster had knocked a guy out, the Irish had knocked PG out, put me in with him, knocked him out, put him with the Scottish kid, knocked him out. Put him with the Cuban in Dublin, knocked him out. Then, of course, everybody knows it's now the last couple of years. I never mentioned it in the last 20 years. Um, I knocked out a Turgetti in the first round. Well, they stopped it, threw in a towel. But I had 12, 12 knockouts in a row, winning four Irish championships, and then win, win the, the, 
internationals and they still weren't going to send me. <laughs> it's, it's crazy sometimes. And obviously we, we have seen obviously instance of politics, you know, within boxing. And I guess probably over the last year, the high performance unit in, in Dublin sort of get, you know, as if they've got their favourites, you know, and who they send to things. And I guess in some ways you're never going to please everybody, but if you're knocking people out, they, they can't stop you from going. Now, if you're stopping guys like, like a human, I fought, you know, big Nicholas Cruz Hernandez was our coach for the Olympics, and he was in the corner of the Cuban team that time. He stayed behind to train us for the for the Olympics that year. He didn't go to he didn't go to Seoul, mm. but he was there. And um, that's when me and Nicholas first seen me, and he always talks about that because I was talking like this all the time. Although Irish team should have him there for, up front and foremost, but the Cuban I fought was like Muhammad Ali. Where he fought, he, had, he put his hands down, he was doing this stuff with his hand, bang, bang, bang. But I just stuck to him like super, like super glue, and um, he didn't know what to do. And I, I gave him two standing counts in the second round, and then boom, it was over. And the same with the Turgetti, the first round, I gave him two standing counts, and then he threw in the towel. So if I'm doing damage to people like that, yep, you know, and the Cuban had a lot of fights. He had, I think he had, I think he said something like over 200 fights by that stage or something. I'm like, well, and um, it was the experience alone, I say, with me stopping all them guys and not even consider me to the Olympics, but then they threw me back into the, the Irish champion. Why did they throw me back in for me to get beat so that he would go? Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't understand the politics, but they wanted to send me to the juniors. But I'm thinking, if I go to the Olympics, I probably won't medal. But what experience will I pick up for the next time around? And Michael Cruz actually went, he was he's a couple of years older than me. But he went he went to Seoul as well. And then the next say next Olympics, of course, he got our first ever goal mm. in men's. So you can't I say as I said at the start of this, you can't you can't pay for experience. I mean you, you, ha, you gotta have it. And because I was I was beating everybody doing this, doing that, it's probably you gotta look back how many Irish guys have ever had 12 markers in a row building up the Olympics and winning four Irish championships within a year. Probably yeah. you wouldn't need any fingers to count. That's what I mean. So it's like for them to even that consider me. And then I think it was like I think my my coach Harry Robinson running. I was training with my other my older brother Noel, like doing weight training with him. And then my Harry came in, said, "They've picked you. They've picked you. They've got you. They've got you." I'm like they've picked you. They've got me. Thank you. Thanks. I was sort of like gobsmacked because I thought it wasn't going. Mm -hmm. And then they they picked me. But at that point, the truth is. If I wouldn't have got picked, I was young, but I probably would have maybe been forced to turn pro. Because I'm not going to sit around for, for four years just for them to say, you didn't go, you had the best record ever, but we're not going to send you, but wait next time. You know what I mean? So, but then let's say that the next time around, I almost didn't go as well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny how boxing can, you know, the saying, and now we see it, we're obviously just past the Olympic cycle as well. Um, we're obviously, you know, with a gold and Kelly Harrington and, and obviously a bronze and Aidan Walsh. And I guess obviously the, the thing in people's minds now is how many of the team will turn pro? You know, how many will decide to stay? And hey, talk to me. <laughs> Do you want them all? I would take, I think Kelly fought brilliantly. I think Walsh, you know, the kid's a great guy. I sort of talked to him after he, he got his medal and stuff. Um, I'm not going to discuss anything, but he. <laughs> No, he, he was, as we talk, you talked to you earlier on about, I said to him, I just reached out to him and said, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. You know, just enjoy yourself and then decide your future. And I'm here for you anytime you want. But, and I said, you probably don't even know who I am. <laughs> but he, he got back and he said, no, I've, watched, I've seen your fights on YouTube. And, and so, so as you say, you can carry that on. Mm -hmm. But I'm not presumptuous to think, oh, you know me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not, I just reached out to him as a, as a, as a, as a as a fan of what he was doing and say, you know, if he wants to go pro, I, I would love to, I'd love to have him here because I think it'd be, if he did come to America, I know he's going to probably get offers to go back home, but let's say when you come to America, it's a big, big, big pond mm. and you're going to be that small face for a little while. But one, the Americans love the Irish over here. I'm telling you, you just, it's, they love it. And you know, if you can fight a little bit, you're going to be well known around this country, around the globe in no time. And to say you can be a big, a big face over there. And it's not about being known, if you know what I mean. But if you, you're going to make more money for yourself and get out of the sport when you quicker than you want to get out. You know what I mean? Where you, mm -hmm. you fight 
certain players you get make smaller money, you're going to fight longer. And I'm not saying you can't fight longer, but the pro game, it's a, it's a dangerous sport. We all know it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. But I've seen a lot of I have friends and former champions that um, kind of put a sentence together on me when they turn 40. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate because, as I say, boxing is one of the only big sports over here in America. Baseball, football, basketball will have pension scheme and stuff. And boxing, which generates probably the most money of them all, because when there's a big fight on, like, you know, since it, Conor McGregor and, and Floyd was a multi puppy billion, mm-hmm. kind of, Floyd gets 200 million, he gets 100. Floyd promotes a car, probably made a billion dollars worldwide on one night. So, as I say, I've said for years, like over and over, about boxing should have a, a union over here and get pension and, and uh, medical and stuff, because over here to pay for medical. And stuff like that for the boxers, whether you're making a thousand dollars or making a million dollars, there was that small percentage out of the purse. So, say a thousand dollars, you get a hundred dollars to go out, you get a hundred thousand, you take out a, a thousand. So, you could break it down like that. So, at the end of that career, okay, this guy who made four or five million is going to get a bigger pension, but the small guy who made a hundred grand, maybe, or maybe 50 grand, even if he had 40 fights, making fifteen hundred dollars a fight, he's still going to get something. Mm-hmm. Exactly, it's a, but, good, it's a good point you raise because a lot of boxers will leave the sport and you know because they live from from fight to fight sort of way the, the, the paychecks they sort of get from a fight they sort of owe money to people by the time they then get their money and then they have nothing left and then they're then forced into probably bigger fights because they, they need money sooner No you're right because say my, my first five was in California I flew over, left Belfast three days later I made my debut on American television and I remember then that I wasn't getting good money. I was getting decent money, but I wasn't getting like peanuts compared to what they're getting today. But the commission in California took out a percentage of my of my purse for, for pension. Mm-hmm. And because it was already took out, I didn't miss it. You know what I mean? And it was probably like five hundred dollars or something, but it was it was something. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, they do pensions. It was the first time I seen that. And then my third fight was also in the same in California as well. And I same thing happened again. But five years later, they send me a check to say they're not doing it. <laughs> but I thought, for me, once it's took out of the purse, you don't see it missing. Mm-hmm. You know, because boxers, you know, you get a purse, say you get $1,000. Most managers take 25 to 33%. So some managers take a third of your purse, 25% of them maybe at the smallest. And then the most trainers, the going rate for a trainer minimum is 10%. And then your taxes, so if you make a thousand dollars, you may be, you may clear four hundred. So people got to look at that. Well, a lot of people think, oh, you made you made a half million dollar payday. I'm like, yeah, I cleared hundred eighty, mm-hmm. and they're like, what? I said, yeah, it's a trick. I, I cleared when I fought in Japan. I made over five hundred thousand dollars back in ninety five. I cleared it. I cleared one eighty after taxes and paying everybody. And people look at you like you're lying. Yeah. First of all. 40% was out of it because 25% was to my manager. Eddie Fudge took 15, which is well worth it, believe me. Mm-hmm. And so there's 40% off that right away. Then you had a training expense of over 100. And then you had your, your own taxes from that. So if you calculate that in your head, you see there's 70% gone already. <laughs> exactly. And then you're but, sort of going all like that. Still, it's still good money, but that's what as you just said at the beginning. At the end, boxers don't know they haven't got anything, nothing, fight to fight. And I learned. You know, my wife, Cheryl, she's a little bit smarter than me. Don't you hear that? Kind of but <laughs> no, we learned to say, you know, you know, we can't live fight to fight. We got to learn how to, you know, if I didn't fight for a year, my hands damaged. I got to have at least money for a year to pay my bills. I can't say, oh, fight to fight. I haven't fight in two months. And then my hands damaged. I'm out of fight. I'm be paid. And people don't understand that too. You don't fight. You don't get paid. Mm-hmm. They're not going to say, who is half your purse? You get, you get nothing. So. As I say, it's unfortunate for boxers that we don't have something like that. But I see, but if you live fight to fight to fight, it's the wrong thing to do. Definitely, you know, right. I guess people learn it very quickly. And I guess with the pandemic, we sort of had for the last eighteen months, a lot of boxers haven't been able to get fights, and obviously they've been living from fight to fight. They now sort of have to realise they want to be involved in boxing. If I'm not going to get fights, it sort of takes the weak away from the strong and sort of keeps keeps them in boxing for the the proper, proper things you want from boxing rather than just for money. Yeah, you're right. It's um, say, 
boxing is a type of sport unless you get some sort of you know some sort of medal maybe somewhere or, or you're good decent prospect you're going to start off probably having a day job and working and it's, it's hard to do that it really is because even as i say my going to my first olympics i was i would work in a, a ytp scheme back home and i, I was in the scheme going to the commonwealth games but I still it's going to come off the game, they produced a gold medal in, or first since since Brian McGuigan in 78. So, you know, I wasn't getting funded. I was I was working in the, the local church as a as a caretaker of the church, you know, as a 18-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. And I was working that job was part-time, but still you're still working, training, and I still produced the goods without all this, you know, special training they're getting today and the money they're getting today. I got a gold medal or, and the Commonwealth Games are pretty was pretty tough then because I say we had we hadn't from 78 until 1990. Then few Commonwealth games we got we didn't get a medal at all in the Commonwealth games. So I produced that and then at the end of 1990 I got a World Cup bronze. Which the World Cup is a big a big competition because and Ireland's that's the first Ireland, Ireland's World Cup medal ever. Because I fought I fought on four fights in a week in Bombay, Bombay, India. And um when you lost the semi-final, I moved up from flyweight to bantamweight and then fought the world champion in the, the semi-finals. He beat me in a close fight. But when you lost the semi-finals, you had to fight the other losing semi-finals for one bronze. Mm-hmm. It wasn't gold, silver, and two bronze. There was one sil- one gold, one silver, and one bronze. So that that's, makes it tougher, like Olympics, gold, silver, and two bronze. And the World Cup, Everybody loved the competition because they actually paid your money as well, like small money. Like I think it was like five grand for gold, twenty five hundred for a silver, and fifteen hundred for a bronze. Mm-hmm. It was a ranking competition. But I, people, when people talk about my medal, nobody ever mentioned that. But I always say to people, it was actually the hardest one to win. But then they're like, no, it wasn't. I said it was because I, I, I had two fights, lost the semi, and then I had to fight again in another fight the next day. So and, and particularly, like if you, if you had picked up like a bad cut or something in your semi final defeat, you would have pretty much gave the other losing semi finalists a free go- I a free four, bronze. I came, I came for, and I, you know, guys who get bronze medals in the Olympics, that's fantastic. You get it, it really is. But my wife said, Why didn't that box off for one bronze? Because they did most competitions have gold, silver, and bronze. I said, Well, just that's the way it is. It's two beaten semi finals get the bronze. But if, it, if that did happen, I think it would be a big kick up. <laughs> There probably would be, you know. I said, I guess, you know, it's like the third and fourth playoff in like a World Cup yeah, and things like that. People aren't really way. probably interested sometimes in That's that what sort is, of playoff. No, it's it's say just no. I think they should keep the Olympics away to have the two bronze. But as you say, you know, if you get injured, Mister Walsh, then you can't fight. <laughs> yep, no, exactly. You know, you know <laughs> If you're going to win something, you want to win it the right way and win it by a fight rather than win it by default. Yeah, say the the Olympics is a stepping stone. I understand the Olympics is like they get the Olympics just fantastic. But for me, my goal was to be WBC world champion. You know I mean? That was my goal, from, as I say, from 15. And, and looking at it, 1990, obviously, um, Commonwealth Games gold. But I think probably what everybody remembers is they weren't able to play Danny Boy properly. So the actual guy playing well, the music. Had they actually sing it, sing it out? Yeah, well, it's funny because you know the guy who sang it, Bob Gibson, was a Belfast man who lived over there, and he's passed away now. I great, became my great friend after that. But um, was it purposely done or not? Mm, let me see. <laughs> no, as I say, we haven't got the, the gold medal for a long time, and I was just standing there, and all of a sudden, they said the machine broke. Maybe it did, but Bob was Bob was one of the officials. Mm-hmm. And um, what's the chances of knowing our man being there and me being there, winning the gold, and, and all of a sudden, you know, New Zealand's full of Northern Ireland people. Everybody stood up, and all, the whole arena starts singing Danny Boy, and I'm the young, you see me stand there, I'm, I'm a young kid, couldn't even grow her, couldn't even grow her, her my stash. <laughs> and um, it was emotional because, you know, when the whole arena stands up and sings Danny Boy, you know, it's just totally fantastic, it really is, and I think, that's one of the highlights probably ever of, of a Commonwealth Games for the whole people to stand up and sing it. And it was, it was a great feeling, and I say it was an honour to, to fight as well and win that, win that gold medal. 
Definitely, as and obviously I said, you probably think back more rather than the gold, and probably just think of the song more than anything. Yeah, yeah. More, more yeah. memorable moment, sort of. You know, everybody's singing, singing "Danny Boy," and I probably I guess it made winning gold that wee bit more sweeter. You know, have everybody here singing. All credit to Bob Gibson. I say, it's like everybody got up on Saturday night, and at the end they're on we we sing song. Bob got up and sang it. You know what I mean? And the everybody joined in, and the whole. The first first line he was singing was only all of a sudden they all they all sang. It's amazing how people around the globe knew Danny Boy. Exactly, and it's all, think, all from that moment. I mean, it was a big thing. It was big, and I say that was thirty one years ago. My goodness, where does time go? <laughs> I was I was a baby, and and well, obviously then moving on to obviously Olympics in ninety two. Obviously, you you get over obviously. The experience of, of 88 and getting the 92 then and, and, and obviously bringing home a silver medal. And, um, I can see obviously in the background, obviously the guy that beat you for for, for the gold is, is obviously in the Hall of Fame now, obviously. Uh, as yeah, well. we, we, we get the funny thing is, you know, Joel Casamori were good friends. You know, I never I never thought my world would ever defect. I mean, most of them don't, they stay there. But he's the fact that after 96, he was number one. He was going to the Olympics and he didn't go. And he defected and, and then he come, where's he come to? Las Vegas. <laughs> so when I first met him, we're like, what? Big hog respect. Is that, how many times are you gonna see an Olympic two Olympic finalists meet each other again, live in the same city, and then getting inducted in the same night? We would only become world champions as well. Two medalists, two world champions, and then duck, inducted in the same night. What's the chances of that? And that wasn't fixed to be like that. Because mm-hmm. that was the I think that was just, that was the seventh year of the Hall of Fame, and um, here in Nevada, and it was we got inducted in the same night. Well, it's the chances. And I think isn't you know? it the people have to sort of vote? You know, they sort of have like a voting sort of thing for all the for all the boxing writers and stuff like that. So they vote for yeah. who they they think is going to be inducted. So a lot of people don't even know why forecast me. They don't. They really don't. Unless you look up your amateur background, you're not you're not going to know. Because mm-hmm. when he turned pro, he was like two weight lads above me. So that's why we never. That's why we never fought in the pro ranks. You know, it would have been a, you know, me and him actually. That would be a great exhibition match. You uh-huh. know, we think that means something. You know what I mean? But uh, say he lives here in Vegas, and say I'm going to fight Sunday. Well, it's a possibility he might be here tonight, so I might see him tonight. <laughs> uh, you're obviously going to pack all your gas tonight. Yeah, I'm going to fight tonight, so should be good because. It's one of the first big fights sort of back in Vegas with a full capacity. Mm-hmm. I've had smaller fights, but not, not maybe three or four thousand people. But this and the team over the arena holds about twenty thousand. Definitely be some occasion tonight. Um obviously uh, not long after the Olympics, um I actually didn't even know this until a few days ago. He actually suffered very badly with mental health. Um obviously now now in 2021. Um, obviously, mental health is probably a lot worse than probably it is that it was obviously for you in the early nineties. Um, but obviously, you know, for anybody sort of suffering mental health, you're probably a good person for anybody to speak to and, and how you get over the difficulties you had. Not to say the Olympic experience, first of all, a lot of pressure. But I, I wasn't then with the Olympics. It was my mind was fine. But I always say to people, when you get hit up the head in boxing over and over and over, and even in training camp, you're sparring, you spar more rounds, like in professional box, 100 rounds, maybe for a 12 round fight. But so you're getting hit up the head every day. So it's got to do some sort of thing in something in your head. I'm not wrong, man, clear. Mm-hmm. But I always said to my, when I go to my doctor, I would say, there's got to be something. It's like, they're, yeah, there's, yeah, it's a normal thing. It's got to do something to your, you know, the yeah. balance in your head or something. Yeah. But I say, mental health, you know, is massive today, but there's some people use it and some people abuse it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm not criticizing anybody because I've been to that door. Mm-hmm. I've been to the door where mental health can 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 put you to suicide. And it can make you a stronger person than what you really are. I've been to the I've been to that door. I've been to this door. This door opened for me. And I was ready to do it. I didn't think. I didn't think. Oh, I'm today. Oh, I'm, I'm depressed today. Tomorrow, I'm going to kill myself. Mm-hmm. No, it's a, it's a slip, slip, slip for months, 
and I was still champ of the world. And I remember it wasn't wasn't this home here, it was another home. And, and I thought about telling myself, my wife didn't even know I was depressed. She, so it was quiet. I didn't, I was getting ready for another fight. And then I just sort of slipped away and slipped away. And I had everything. But yet I had nothing, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um, people think because you're a champ of the world, you've got a car and you've got a home, that you're, oh, you're, you're happy. He's got to be happy. He's, look, he's got everything. You know, first of all, I never got anything handed me in the first place. I worked hard for it. Second of all, I've helped a lot of people. And thirdly, at that point, I didn't care if I had a Rolls Royce in my parking lot or a, or a Mini Cooper. It didn't bother me because all I wanted to do was kill myself. Mm-hmm. And like and, a- more recently, sorry, I think I cut you off here. More recently, obviously, I think Ryan Burnett, obviously, his dream was to become a world champion. And then when he became a world champion, he realised that it wasn't what he actually wanted. You know, it's as if, you know, where somebody dreams of a goal or a vision. Um, and when Ryan Burnett became a world champion, um, he was going, is this it? You know, it sort of got to where he thought was his goal and then realised that it was probably more to life than sort of achieving. Because a gold medal was only going to be worth so much. Whereas no. you obviously wanted to provide and have a life out of it as well. I know Ryan's right. It's a, you reach your pinnacle, you reach the top and think, what do I do now? And my goal was have to become a three-term world champion, which I thought I, to this day I was. I was robbed a few times in belts and I should have been, but I'm not. And I, I hate when some journalists would say, oh, but you're not. I'm like, yeah, because you got to buy the season, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Many times have you stepped in a ring. I mean, I'm not that I wouldn't. I'm not that forceful of people, but don't yeah. criticize me. When the truth is, you get a bad decision. What can you do about it? Nothing. But I say the mental health issue was a point where my wife didn't know, and then the one night I was ready to do it, middle of the morning, she was sleeping, and but that's why I did it in the middle of the morning because I knew she mm-hmm. did, she could you could put big Ben beside her and she wouldn't wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I put it myself and would sleep. I know, but but you. But then for some reason, I, I say I came down in the middle of the night to my garage and, and had a plan. Actually, it was in my, sorry, my living room. It was in my living room. There's a thing coming in the garage, my living room. And, and she walked out and called me. No, I'm, I'm saying when she, I'm not saying when she called me. She called me with a rope in my hand. Mm-hmm. And I say, we broke down tears. But at that point, then I got help. But before that, she didn't even know. I was depressed and I'm still training for fights still. I think the training kept me my mind sort of some sort of level was okay mm. but the truth is when you're not in bed at night and you close your eyes the, the lights come on and the, the demons go in your head and then thank god i'm still here but because my daughter would never see my daughter but people don't realize i went through that and i say it wasn't that i was going to do it it was that i was going to, it was it was being done mm-hmm. and if Cheryl wouldn't have walked out that night i wouldn't be here talking to you i really wouldn't have been because i you get to the point you're scared to do it and then you get to the point where you're not scared to do it and when you're not scared to do it it's the point where you're like i'm so calm i can do this and that's why suicide is a big thing when it breaks down to mental health if you don't get the help you could be gone and let's say i with this here and i i'm i've did i have helped a lot of people because they read my book and seen it and they're like i did i didn't know that you went through it and when i say stuff like that it's almost like how can you go through that? Mm-hmm. But people don't realize we're all humans and we're all, you know, success doesn't mean you're happy. Let's see what well, Rand said that, don't mean it's more or less, too. it doesn't mean you're happy, it doesn't mean this. And whether you're world famous or just a little homeless person, you can still have mental problems and, um, and um, kill yourself. And, and, and see, again, sorry, I think I cut you off there again. I think it's just the, the time difference. I guess the thing is, is, People don't really know, you know, how do you really know somebody's suffering? Because you can be suffering in so many ways nowadays. Like, you know, you could look like the, the most happiest person in the world, but you could be the one that could be most at danger because you're putting on a fake front for people. I did that. Mm-hmm. I trained, I trained, I was champion of the world, you know, in 96. And it was, when I look back at it, I say, I'm not saying I was cured. Mm-hmm. I got, I did get, I got help. You know, I don't really, Psychiatrist, I'm not running psychiatrist running down, but I didn't. I went to a homeopathic medicine guy, gave me natural pills, not, not prescription pills. I got natural pills that are made from the earth. And I, to this day, I take them. Mm-hmm. Like how many years ago, I 25, I still take them because 
you're not cured. You're not, you're never cured of, of, of depression. You never, you know, you're, it's with um, the medication with Dr. Wiggity, you sort of, you stabilize yourself to be sort of like, you're not sure what your chemical balance will have said it, but the homeopathic medicine is all stuff that they took from the earth back in the, when the Indians all were on the earth. Mm. So I just believe in stuff like that, natural medicine and say with, I used to, I took natural medicine for brain trauma when I was fighting. Many boxers can say that, I never did. I, before and after fights, I took this medication to help with brain trauma. Because as I say, even though you win fights, you get some trauma to your head still. So this medicine can clear your head. Mm-hmm. And as I say, I'm 51 years old now and I can still still talk. And um, But to say, back to mental health, I, I've got a few people I reached out to, one in Belfast, a friend here. And every month, they want me to reach out to him and just say, are you okay? Because they know they're suicidal. Mm-hmm. And I just reach out to him and, are you doing okay? His thing. And they're like, yeah, I'm doing this, doing that. Fine, thank you for reaching out. I re- and um, I reached out to one last night, I guess, I guess, from Belfast. So I help people. And I'm not saying I'm cured. But as I say to people, if you're feeling like yourself, if you feel like you're getting depressed and you start to close in, talk to somebody. Because I didn't. But I'm trying to say now, if you talk to somebody, it's the best thing. And you only, you have to talk to the right person. It could be mm-hmm. the closest person to you, your wife, your husband, your parents, you know, it could be an aunt and uncle or whatever. But if you don't talk, it clogs up even deeper and deeper and deeper. And then boom, it's the point where you're going, boom, I'm done. And then you're gone. And to say mental health, you know, is that type of thing that's, it's never going to go away. It's not. Tyson Fury uh, Fe- Fe- talked about it as well. I mean, but this, and he's got everybody champ of the world. I mean, so people talk because if somebody, if you talk to somebody and they laugh at you, talk to somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, some people are like, oh, you're stupid. You Who can be suicidal? Have you heard that before? You can't should be stupid. But I, I've never had that. I never had that. So when my wife called me and called me, my goodness, and. That was, she knew it was, well, she knew then I wasn't going to be here. Mm -hmm. So she knew that was a, the the mental health thing was a real thing. And And say, if I can help people, anybody can reach, anybody can reach out to me anywhere on social media. It's so easy to reach out. You have to call somebody, you can reach out on social media. And if you got a bunch, if you're on a bunch of friends, you're like, they don't even know you're depressed, but you, and you're worried about what they're going to say, reach out to me. Don't care what they're saying. Because mm-hmm. your real friend will stick by you and give you support. It, it's, it's, it's a big thing, obviously. I'd it, say it's even more so. I think that there's th- there seems to be in certain time periods, at certain years, and you know, I remember a, a small town in Wales where it seemed to become like a like a cult sort of thing to do. It was like a it was like a cool thing sort of to do. Whereas now we're seeing more and more probably higher profile. You know, people like Tyson Fury it's had it, and it's obviously put on all the weight. Obviously. You know, he said he obviously took drink and obviously was speeding in the car and decided that was up. They see where he's been at his, his lowest, they obviously now been at his highest. Um, but obviously still every day is going to be a challenge for him as well. It is, I say with Tyson, Tyson Fury did the, you know, he did the drugs and did the fast cars. I didn't, I trained. Mm-hmm. You know, it was my, you know, I could have been, I could have been the type of guy who wanted to drink, who wanted the fast car to play. Training, I trained twice a day every day. And I, I still train every day. Because to me, that's my, my psychiatrist in my head. Because when I go for a run in the morning, you know, that run, I'm, I'm with myself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can talk to yourself. It's okay to talk to yourself. You start on answering your own questions and you have a problem. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's good, good, good for your mind and say other people can go the other way and, and do crazy things. But I'm not, I'm not judging anybody because I, I could have went that way. Mm-hmm. And Tyson Fury went that way, and he, and and he's on the platform now to to help people and say, I don't know Tyson Fury like personally. I met him a couple of years ago down my heavyweight spar with him. We had a bit of a talk together, but you know, I told I said your mom was your mom was born in Belfast, so that's what cracked the ice. And he said, oh, yeah, she was born in Nuts Corner and stuff like that. So we know each other like that, but it's great that he, he can do that and help and say. When you get somebody like him and like somebody like me who have that problem, 
then other people think, oh, I'm not on my own. Yeah. As, as the big thing seems to be, it's, it's, it's okay not to be okay is obviously the big, big tagline yeah. with it as well. Um, but obviously, as I say, I know there's been so much of it, and, it, and it's not more for the fact that I don't obviously didn't include this in the interview in any way to sort of gain views or gain reactions out of it. it was more for the fact that even somebody as awesome as Wayne McCulloch has obviously been through tough times as well. So it's it's not all plain sailing. No, it's it? not. It's not say, whether you're a boxer, whether you're a carpenter, whether you're a mechanic, whether you're sitting at home unemployed. You know, mental health can be anybody. It can attack anybody. It doesn't. It's not just going to say, "Oh, you're rich, I'm going to attack you. You're poor, I'm going to attack you." Mm -hmm. We all we all have different, you know, personalities, and and I say, my wife's a strong person. You know, it doesn't. She she has never felt that way. So a strong person is the one you have to leech onto, mm -hmm. because they're going to help you. They're not going to they're not going to judge you. They're going to help you. I say that. Just, anybody out there can need to do that and don't don't even if somebody laughs at you just walk away and don't don't take it personal because that can drive you even deeper you, you just have to get the right person to talk to but you have to talk to somebody you have to talk to somebody not to be a psychiatrist it could be somebody you could talk to because sometimes a good talk just gets it off your head and sort of and you could do that the other way you know i mean talk to somebody just sort of that could be your your therapy yeah, it could be a release and, and, and get things right. And obviously the good going said behind behind every good man there's an even better woman. So obviously Cheryl's obviously helped you a lot there. So obviously if she listens back to later on, she'll know that we're bigging her up. And I know you give her a, a backhand backhanded compliment earlier on as well. So my wife's been with me since I'm at 16 years old and I heard you know social media today you hear less, you know, when a certain story comes out, like it was one the other day. Good great story about me the other day, fantastic story. Then you get these I just call them bastards. You come on and say a lot of shit about your wife and stuff, and they don't know her. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, and you some stupid stuff. And that's why my wife doesn't really want me to be on social media because I want to come to your door and knock it. <laughs> it's, it's one of them things, but people people jealous at times. So they'll make up a story, you know, they maybe heard something and then they add something else into it. And, you know, it could ruin people nowadays, you know, when we just talk their mental health. Some yeah, they, no, people, could be. Yes, they were, people. people with the mental health, people judge them, people, they could just drive them to suicide. Mm -hmm. And I say, what people judge people, say that, you know, I've got good faith in God, of course. Don't, if you judge somebody, be prepared to be judged yourself. Mm -hmm. Then people don't want to be judged because they're the ones judging other people. You know, they're the ones who are not, they're the ones who have nothing wrong with them. They're perfect. <laughs> I know, I know the the bit of a story. I think you're you're talking about obviously coming back, um, obviously coming back, and obviously people looking to lynch you, and and obviously then finding out you're Wayne McCulloch, you know. So obviously you'd have probably been more recently. We probably would have Carl Frampton probably idolised on both sides um, in Northern Ireland, and obviously you were the same. You know, was it was it something just obviously I guess in your upbringing sometimes that you just respect the people that face value rather than religion. So you know, like you you were obviously you carried the tricolor in the Olympics. You know, you come home from the Olympics. You were obviously marched up by a band up the Shankill and stuff like that. So you, you were idolised on both sides. You know, I think we sort of talked a wee bit off camera. You know, I guess sometimes I want to make sure the questions I ask are in the right sort of context that you know what it's for, but. Obviously, it's good to know that you can be idolised both sides of the divide in Northern Ireland, because let's face it, we've moved on from the, the dark days of the past. Yes, yeah, the way it should be, because as I say, when I first came here, you know, Matt Tenney, my manager, he, first of all, he had a pair of green shorts with the shamrock on for me. And I said to him, I'll wear them no problem. The first, my first two fights I wore them. I said, Matt, you know, I fought my club colours back home, which is blue and white. I fought in the Irish colours green and white and then the olympics in 92 was red and a blue vest of course because of the corners but you're great yeah, i fought my green vest probably 50 times ulster vest probably a dozen times and my club vest over over 300 but i said i don't need to show people i'm irish because i am irish mm -hmm. i didn't to say you know my good friend rick um mickey ward was in he's on my wall here he's in my garage irish mickey ward he's and he always called, somebody called, he said, he said, somebody called him a fake patty. 
I say, well, your generation doesn't say it otherwise because you're, you're a true Irishman. Mm -hmm. But he called him Irish Mickey Ward, so, which is fine. But with me, I fought in the Olympics for Ireland, got the medal, came here. The market doesn't know what they've seen the Olympics. And I don't need to put green on to show I'm, I'm fucking green, you know, because I'm from, from Belfast, Northern Ireland. I represent Ireland, north and south, east, west. And I said to him, I want to fight in the colors that I like. And the colors I liked over here was actually the baseball team called the Colorado Rockies. Mm -hmm. They had black, they were like black, purple, and silvers, so or a bit of white. So I saw my outfits would be black, purple, and silver, some be white with black and purples. So it, it sort of changed a little bit, but they almost had them colors from my third fight onwards. And I did that through my career then after that. I just fought in the colors that I wanted to do because when I fought for Ireland and Northern Ireland, and then he had the shorts, they were telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to do what I want to do, and I, I didn't, I wasn't gonna, you know, label myself because I fight for the north, south, east, west of Ireland, and everybody knows where I'm from. And I say, I'm from a Shanga Road, but I'm still an Irishman, you know what I mean? And people probably come on in and criticize me, but mm -hmm. what you call it Northern Ireland, it's not called Northern England, mm -hmm. you know, Welsh person, Scotch person, Englishman, what do they call themselves? Englishman, Scotchman, Welshman. Northern Irish man, so you're an Irish man. I mean, so, yep. so probably get criticized for that. People like to criticize me. <laughs> oh, no. do, do you know what it is, Wayne? People always give their opinions nowadays, but at the end of the day, you, you didn't you didn't pick a side. And, you know, no. Carl Frampton, obviously, more recently, but in social media times, has been very, very praised for 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 being down the middle and well, representing both sides. But Carl and me, we're not doing it for praise. Mm -hmm. We're doing it because we, we, know, we understand what Northern Ireland is all about. And I see, after the, the solo came back, and people talked about that, you know, my family got hassled back home when I carried the flag. Well, if I got hassled with carrying the flag, as soon as I stepped foot in high field estate, they ran me out of it. Mm -hmm. But what they do have the Shanghai Road Defender Flute Band march me down to the Rangers, Rangers Supporters Club. How much more proud can you get than that? Yeah. And they weren't, they weren't doing that to show we're proud and we're proud. But if they didn't, if they didn't respect what I did as a sportsman, they would never have did it. Why would they do it? Mm -hmm. You know, say Jerry Adams sends me a congratulation right after the 92 Olympics from Sinn Féin. So there's bitterness. Mm -hmm. There's none. It just goes to show you they can, that, 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 that they could be over their total, total piece, but you have a small group here and there, so it's not going to Yeah, but just the minority happen. always... But main card, we, we did it, we did it because we wanted to do it, not because we had to do it, we did it because we wanted to. And Carla, you know, we're good friends and we talked about it and stuff. We did it because we wanted to, we didn't wear these. It's like, just imagine, imagine me and Carl walking in with like Rangers supporters club, short or something, you know I mean? Mm. You know, the only club I supported my whole life was, was Liverpool. I support, I support Northern Ireland and I support Ireland. Mm. When they play each other, I'm going to support Northern Ireland. But when if Ireland play another team, they support Ireland. Northern Ireland play another team, they support Northern Ireland. Because that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't in the oldest political teams back home and, and then Scotland. They're not in that time, which is Liverpool or my national team. You know, so. And you obviously had, you, you were obviously able to celebrate for probably nearly the first time in, in what about no, that, 20, 20 sarcasm. years last year that's as well. So. Sarcasm. It's sarcasm. <laughs> do not want to hear you? No, we had the we had the best year ever, of course, in thirty years, and um, it almost didn't didn't finish. And then we did have the worst year, but we started well this year too. Wins. <laughs> no, I'm the type of guy. I support Liverpool from the start. Also, from the finish. I'm not going to be. You know, one of these guys is wishy you well, I'm going to I'll support you now next week, man, save next week. No, I've never pulled. I go back to, I was a goalkeeper. I love Ray Clemens. He gave me a, he gave me a signed shirt one time. Bruce Grobler and stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I'm the old, I was more or less the goalkeeper guys. Mm -hmm. You know, but Kenny Douglas, Ty McDermott, guys like that, they were all, you know, people that I loved. And that was back in the days. <laughs> you know, so that's my team. And what was all the only team? Win or lose. <laughs> And I'm just thinking, obviously, from you won the Commonwealth Games in '90 until obviously what well, last year, you know, Liverpool won that 30-year period of obviously you've been through a whole boxing career. 
I didn't hear anything you said. <laughs> oh. um, you obviously touched on obviously. <laughs> no, that. It, was, it was worth the wait. <laughs> definitely was it. It make, definitely makes it taste taste better. Um, yeah. you, you sort of touched on obviously the legend that's Eddie Eddie Fox obviously at the start there. Obviously, when you turned pro in '93, um, how did did the signing come off the back of the Olympics, or, or how did it come about? The same with, with Eddie Fudge and my, just I was supposed to go to Sugar Leonard's old train on the East Coast, Baltimore, Maryland. That was the original plan, but two weeks before I left. And um, Matt came over to see me. He came over and signed me up in Belfast or in Dublin, actually, where the, I was at a function in Dublin, like November, I think it was, of 92. Barry McGuigan was with him. I, that's when I, this, the contract was sort of signed up. I didn't fight till February, but yeah, I was supposed to go to um, Yang, I think it was Yang Morton, was the guy's name. He was one of Sugar Land's old training, not the main coach. And then all of a sudden, Eddie had a look at me from the Olympics. And it, a week's notice, I was going to fly to Baltimore, Maryland, but then I switched to Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank goodness, because I don't like the cold weather anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't know any different, but it was not part of the country. They get snowed in for three months, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But Eddie took me on, and like all of a sudden, I, I say I flew here, went to LA, met up with one of Dell's assistants, Del, Del Torrance. He worked my corner for that fight. Then the next day, I flew to Vegas and met Eddie Fudge. And Eddie was in my corner until my fourth or fifth fight because he was training Reddick Bowe, the heavyweight champion of the world, Mike McCallum, three-time world champion. And that was his focus. But he did – I went to training camps with Reddick Bowe and Mike McCallum. And some of my fights, my first four, I think it was, he couldn't make it to the corner. But he had people like like Thel was our Thel Torrance, Hazelman Lewis, a former top welterweight, and then uh, Freddie Roach was there at the beginning. But – um. So he had capable people of taking the reins. Mm -hmm. But with um, then Eddie, I went to Belfast, my seventh fight. He was in my corner in my fifth and sixth fight as well here. Then seventh fight was in Belfast. Eighth fight was in Dublin. And Eddie was there. And um, just, I say with Eddie, Eddie looks at my gym every day here. It's just, it's just, for me to go to him, it's priceless. It's just, holy smoke. I'm like, the stuff that he taught me, they say he lived, he was 90. And this, he, he was working until he was like 88 years old. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that he just taught my mind and about life and about, you know, everything, not just about boxing. Eddie became my friend. And then and, um, he wasn't credible with the money because he, he was successful. Mm -hmm. Too many of these trainers today are worried about, it, about how much money they're making and about their pockets getting bigger, not about the, the fighter. Eddie, Eddie cared about the boxer. And I say, I want to be that type of person as well as a coach. And pass it on and say what he taught me. It's like going to college for four years. Mm -hmm. You know, I was with him and I say on the wall over here, I'm the only out of those 20 world champions, I'm the only one to get a letter signed by him about being a coach someday and about listening and being established and stuff like that. And it's on my wall here. It's like a diploma. You know, I think a lot of trainers maybe should have that because you know the, the special training back home in the amateurs, you know, I Back in 2001 in Belfast, the World Amateurs, I went over there and did training things for free. I said, we needed to train the coaches first before the training fired. Mm -hmm. And everybody was on board, the president of the Irish Box and the Ulster president. I was going to be part of it. And then what happened? I wasn't part of it. And they, then Nicholas was pushed away. Mm -hmm. So people got their cozy jobs instead of them worrying about the fighters. But I say, we're, we're, we're split with amateur boxing and fashion boxing. I say I was I was spoiled with Eddie Fudge. You know, it's a problem. You, when you get when you get the cream of the crop, it's hard to get somebody here. But as I say, I don't want to be I don't want to be a boxing trainer. I want to be a boxing teacher. And Eddie was a teacher. Because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of boxing trainers, towel on the shoulder, and they're 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 a trainer. When really what's the fundamentals of boxing? It's called the sweet science. What is the sweet science? You know, and I say, Eddie told me that. Yeah. And, and like, obviously, your, your debut year, like, it's probably not so much we see now, but you fought 11 times your first year as a pro. Was it sort of still you were on that mentality, sort of, that you were still an amateur? You were obviously getting so many fights, or like, because nowadays, I think, I think here in Belfast, we probably had Sean McComb, probably, I think, it fought eight times in the first year, but was it just 
Yeah. You were so used to fighting so regularly. You just get your name out there, get your name out there, get wins. You know, I think the first year I had something like 14, 15 fights scheduled. Mm-hmm. But I hurt my hand a lot. I had a lot of hand damage, cortisone sheds and stuff, and I had to put a few of them off because I started off quick and then I fought in June in Belfast, September in Dublin. I was supposed to fight in August, hand damage. I'd say I could have fought... I could have fought once or twice a month, no problem. I was, only, I was doing four rounds and six rounds. Mm-hmm. So, as you say, it wasn't like amateur boxing. It was professional, but it was quick. You know, you couldn't do 10 fights a year, 12, 12 rounds, I mean. Especially if you went the distance every time. But I want to be a busy fighter and say, March of, of 94, I have my, uh, my 12th fight in, in 13 months. But my 11th my 11 fight in January of 90, 94, or 94, yeah. I became number five in the world when the NBA fell to beer. Mm. And I wasn't a rush to the top. I wasn't because it was Eddie's plan. I, Eddie picked the fights and, and they're all tough Mexican mostly. But Eddie picked the fights and, and different, you know, do this, do this, do this. And then in June of 94, we get the elimination fight for the WBC belt, which is one of the hardest fights I ever fought because I was fighting a guy, Victor Ravanalis, who was former two time world champion, number one contender. And I was number five. But I had to beat him just to get a crack at the belt. Mm. No, no, nowadays people really don't do that. But I did that, and I was supposed to fight for the belt right after that, which would have been my 14th fight. Mm-hmm. But I had to, the the world champion wanted he wanted um, time to fight another defense, so I had to wait from June of '94 until July of '95 to get a crack. But of course, I had three fights in between <laughs> as well. I took a risk. I took mm-hmm. a risk fighting him. Like I, I fought a former world champion in Dublin that year as well, 94. I took a risk. But I didn't want to fight any, I didn't want any easy fights. I don't want the fights that were going to teach me to get better. And to say that's what Eddie, Eddie, Eddie picked the fights. It was the fights weren't 100 percent going to win or 90%. They were like really, it could have been 60-40. Mm-hmm. You no, know, at the Robin Alice fight was 50-50. You know, the NABF belt was a maybe 60-40 for me. But I fought a guy who had 10 wins and one draw. He was undefeated. I was 10 no. So that's the type of fights that I wanted to fight. And I, I did that in my career. And I want to be known for the guy who fought everybody and fought and fought. I fought the best in three to beat Carl. You know, thank, you know, thank you to Carl. That he really mean I'm I know that I'm number one. Ireland's number one fighter in the last 30 years. Because he did, although I say I said I thought I got three belts, I didn't get three belts. Mm-hmm. But I fought the Yagi Shiji was the number one, number one guy in the division at the time. You know, Morales is number one in his division, a step up in Super And then, of course, Hamid's the number one guy in the featherweight division. Mm-hmm. And I, I pushed him for everything they have. Whether I should have got the season out against Hamid or not, it's debatable. But Morales beat me in a close fight. But if I fought three guys in three divisions, who are the best in the pound for pound fighters, you know, I, I say I think I'll have to call for, for even put me there. Thank you for that. Because journalists, it's funny how journalists don't even see that. Where Carl, a fighter, sees that. A, a, another fighter. Mm-hmm. You know, it's unfortunate they don't see that. But yeah, they do see the bouts and sort of they think of that. Yeah, they're yeah, beating that fight. So whatever. But look who you fought. How you, did you get beat or did you? You know, that's the way it goes. Mm-hmm. But it takes a boxer to see that. <laughs> It does, and it's, 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 that, um, it's that thing sometimes. It's like people will obviously think back of, of, of things for yourself, you know, in, in your career, and they'll think of obviously you fighting Prince Nassim and Eric Morales and winning your world title in Japan and Danny Boy in the in the Commonwealth Games. They'll look at certain wee points, whereas they'll not look at how close a fight was or where my colleague should have been this or where my colleague should have been that. They just look at the pure facts and go one belt rather than going. But it, yeah, it should have been more. Yeah, I mean, that's that's 100% right. The journalists, for the likes of the Hall of Fame and stuff like that, here at Canastota, journalists vote for boxers and themselves. Mm-hmm. Why can't the ex-boxers vote for the boxers? Mm-hmm. They get to vote for the, the boxer. Why? Because, let's say, Carr was the example. He knew who I fought in three divisions. And he's the first one to say that. Where the journalist didn't say that, you just got beat by them guys. He didn't compete. Yeah. You just got beat. And to say when I as soon as it gets robbed out, you know, 
you know, when, when Card fought Leo Santa Cruz, then fight for sensational. Card won the first and lost second, but he went either way. Mm-hmm. And the second fight, he could have won that too. No, that's the way it goes. And when he hit it, Jonathan comes, so you all lost the fight easily. Like, yeah, whatever, dude. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I love it when a fighter can just look at it and, and say something about another fighter. The, the, the truth, so he should have won that fight. But Jonathan's like, no, he didn't. I wasn't even asking you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, obviously, Japan, um, you know, going going away, obviously since TJ Dahini, obviously, um, done the, you know, sort of, you, you set the mold that obviously TJ was able to follow, but but going to Japan and, and obviously um, becoming the WBC World Bantamweight Champion, um, I can't even pronounce your opponent's name. Um, I'll pronounce some, it for you. Yoshi Yagoshi. Um, Yoshi Yagoshi. There we are. I, I'm not even attempting to say that. No, when I went to Japan. I, I didn't know at the time when I won that I was the first, first fighter from Ireland or the UK to come back with a belt because English men have done it before so it was kept pretty quiet but it wasn't until Randall Monroe went over there a few years back and lost that they were saying oh Randall Monroe is going to be going to be tried the second fighter from Britain or I never did win a belt and I'm like so I, I was the first I didn't even know that I didn't know how hard it was and then TJ Tahini went over there and he got ripped to pieces by I remember I think it was Teddy Atlas said he get there was a robbery then the job job fighter won blah 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 and I said to TJ, I said, don't even listen to anybody. Just you won the fight. It's hard to get a win in Japan. Take the win, take your belt, and let, ignore them. Mm-hmm. And um, and he did that, and he became the second to do it. And I say Katie Taylor became the second Irish woman to win the WBC belt. But say if you, if you have the foundation laid for that, you know other people are going to do it. It's, Sometimes it's, it takes it's, one. Person. It's like the, like breaking the the mile record. It takes one person to do it. And that's just any they all can do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it just once, takes up once one. somebody sees it can be done, the mold's there and they can copy it. Yeah. They just copy the mold and um the generation to come, you know, can see that and think, oh, I can see, it, see that. And that's how that's how people remember you. they can morales fight, the Hamed fight. People watch them fight. See, they, they watch the fights and they don't watch it to the end. I know they don't. Because like that fight was sensational. Like, you and Morales just two tore to and Hamed. He just ran from you. He mm-hmm. ran around. We were calling them on. I was like, that was a great win for you. I said, um, I actually lost the fight. And you lost the fight. No way. You lost the fight. I'm like, you can't beat the corporate. He was signed by HBO. Invited on HBO. The commentators are all biased, except for Big George, who thought I won. So you can't beat the corporate. But, and they're like shocked. Because they're probably watching on a TV with no sound on it. So they're not listening to the commentating. Mm. So they're watching for themselves. But when you're influenced by the commentators, as they say, Hamid was signed by HBO, which would be illegal. Promote, he's signed by them. And then um, their commentators are going to be all biased. Let's say, except for George, who knew me, mm. was really not really good to me. I say that fight, Frank Warren was a promoter. He, I've got him on video saying he gave me a rematch. He would have. But, but um, Hamid left him and he left Brendan Engel after that fight. And then that was his the start of his, his down slope. Because he did, he knocked out 18 guys in a row before he fought me. Mm-hmm. But I believe I pushed him to the limit. And I, I'm, if, I do, if I'm standing in the middle of the ring doing this, the, one of the best plan for plan fires, moving up two divisions, and you're not coming to fight me, how can you win the fight? You know what I mean? Seriously. Mm-hmm. Back in the old days, the referee would say, you need to start fighting, you're going to keep you out. <laughs> yep. Hi, you're here you to know? fight, you're not here to, you're not here to not dance here fight. To, yeah. But he's getting his $10 million, whatever, and stuff like that. Never got the rematch. He, he left to say he did his own promotion, and then he lost to Brewer. And then that was a, the sort of end of it. Did, are he you won. sort of proud that, that, um, that obviously, how, how strong your chin was? Obviously, I don't think you ever knocked down and as, a, as a pro boxer. Is it sort of is that another proud moment you can sort of say you have as a, as a boxer and saying that you know nobody could do you any damage? It is and it isn't. <laughs> no, I did. I do. I do have a good chin, but I, I say when I came here, Eddie's a lot of Eddie's, um, you know, boxing schooling was defense. Mm-hmm. You know, not talking about like this here. A lot of like when you throw a jab. If I throw a jab at you, you're probably going to throw right hands. If I do this and you want to hit me, but I do this, I can catch it. So the commentators can't see that. And then if you throw left hook after, I can do this. 
if you throw an uppercut here, I can do this, bump. So the little small thing they got that I did, I did have a good chin, I did get hit good shots, but when you when you fought and they did the replay and one shot and they hit me a big shot, you know, they see that one shot and think you take a lot of shots. And say the Robin Ellis fight hit me. He's a, he's the only guy to have me out on my feet. I thought he was watching television in my wife for like 10 seconds. <laughs> he hit me with an overhand like shot like this. He came on the knees like that, hit me, boom. Because I was trying to perfect the, the guard, but mm -hmm. I hadn't perfected it yet. And I say with him having 50 fights on my 13, you know, he had more knockers in his record than I had fights. But I learned from that and I say, and I didn't, I had a good chin. The chin was good enough not to go down. And um, I'm fortunate for that. But I, a lot to do with defense. You know, if I could hit all the shots that they all said I did, I wouldn't even talk them to you. I'd be like, sitting like this, slurring my word. But I, my defense was, was better than people coming to this you know, criticize it for. Mm -hmm. And he always said that. He said, I was like, he's doing this, he's doing this. And one of my documentaries, I think it's The, the Street of Dreams. There's a part in with, with my manager and Eddie. I, moved, I fought a featherweight fight three months before I fought for the belt, just to walk, just keep me warm. I guess a tough Mexican. Mm -hmm. But I, was, I perfected the defense like this in that one fight just before the championship. It was perfect timing. And Eddie, Matt was criticizing me. And, and, and Eddie's like, yeah, it's in the documentary. Eddie's like, no, 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 no. He was doing this and doing this and doing this. Eddie was 84 at that point. He's, he's still showing my did it. And, but he was right because even my manager couldn't even say that. But Eddie said, no, he's not getting hit clean shots. He's catching the shots or rolling the shots or blocking the shots. And he was right. He was right. Yeah. And unfortunately, commentators don't see that. Because they don't, they don't know boxing, what I'm Boxing right. commentators do. The boxing commentators do. The ones who have fought. I'm not criticizing the ones who haven't fought. But watch what they're doing. Watch Floyd Mayweather when he's defending himself. You're calling the shot he get hit with and he didn't get hit with it. He just mm -hmm. wanted to get some bump, bump, And it's unfortunate that they do that because um, Floyd did get hit. But he didn't get hit as much as they, they said he did. And it's, it's all down to be perfecting that craft. Um, obviously, your, your first defeat um, as, a, as a pro, and obviously you moved up to Super Bantam, um, obviously fought Daniel Zaragoza. Yeah. How, how did you obviously deal, deal with your first defeat as a pro? Because I know everybody always thinks of Floyd Mayweather going to go their whole career unbeaten um, and things like that. And, you know, the, the young amateurs and things coming through nowadays, the, the first defeat sometimes can be the, the make or break of people. How did you deal with the defeat and how did you, how did you rebuild your confidence? It was, it was tough, the fact that I thought I won and Eddie thought I won. You know, I remember in the last two rounds, Eddie just said, just keep putting the pressure on. You're, you're winning. I, went, I, went, I ran through him the last two rounds. I ran through. And then the Zagre was a Hall of Famer. He, he's, he was the older guy at the point. And yeah, the last two rounds, I pushed him. Could have should have been 10 rounds, but it wasn't. And then um, the decision being read, split decision. I'm like, what? And then, of course, he got the decision. It was in Boston, sold out arena. Mm -hmm. There was something going on that night. It really was. And I remember... You know, the referee rode back in the bus with me and his wife gave the decision to me. She was one of the judges. And he said to me, I didn't know him personally. Mm -hmm. I thought you won that fight. I've heard that from that fight. I've heard it from my first fight with Larius, from the referee. Both said to me, I thought you won the fight, clearly. So when you hear from them, and then you're like, why did they take it away from me? My mm -hmm. second division belt. And, and to say, I thought I won. Journalists think, oh, you lost. But as I say, we got the fight of the year, WBC fight of the year, and didn't get a rematch. I guess sometimes when they don't give you a rematch, it's probably praise to you that they, they know that they don't want to fight you again because they got away with one. Yeah, that's what Dan is arguing again the next few months, probably six months later, because I had to crack cheap one. But we could have fought a trilogy. I'd have fought him again. I know we'd have beat him because I'd have made sure. I was not saying I should have made sure the first time I thought I was making sure. Mm -hmm. But, and then we'd have fought a trilogy. And, and I said that that was the end of his career because he was, he fought Mark. He fought in a fight after that in Japan, one against Ta Tachiyoshi, beat him, former world champion. And then he fought Merrick Morales. He was hitting the scorecards and he hit with the body shot and sat down on the canvas and looked over at Morales and went, almost like I'm passing the baton to you. He was hitting the scorecards against Morales. That's saying something, how tough mm -hmm. this guy was. 
and I've been criticized before. Oh, you beat by an old man. I'm like, well, he was 30. And when I fought Hamid, Hamid gets up and says, oh, you lost a, a 36 year old. I said, oh, sorry, no, he was actually 39. And he's like, he was stunned that I actually said he was old. Mm. <laughs> Happens with 51 and defends World Championship. You know what? Because yeah, it, it, it didn't be a matter on it. No, but he was a whole, he was a three time world champion. There's no shame in that, is there? Mm. You know? But obviously, <laughs> obviously, coming back from the defeat, then um, you obviously had two, two more straight wins um, before obviously then jumping up the, up the featherweight and fighting and the same Hamed. And I guess probably people will probably look more at that fight because I think Hamed, it was Halloween, it was the 31st of October or something like that, I think. And he had obviously yeah, a massive ring entrance. Yeah, Hamed, Hamed, mate, we were back in 93. He fought my undercard in Dublin. And then he fought in, he fought in um, against Manuel Medina in 96 when I was World Bantamweight Champion of Featherweight. He fought there and all of a sudden I get these social media was sort of getting, it wasn't getting started, but it was, I heard rumblings back home that he had posters around Dublin saying, forget about McCulloch comes to the Prince. We're two divisions of power, what's that all about? I mean, don't go to, don't go to my home country and do that either. Mm-hmm. And then he said in the newspaper that my wife is scared of me fighting. Well, that was the last straw. I jumped on a flight met up with my buddy Mick Devine in, in Dublin, went straight to the Guinness factory for the weigh-in, confronted Hamid right in front of his entourage of about 30 people. <laughs> and I just said to him, you know what? I, think, I, don't care, I don't care what you say about me. You can say what you want. Don't, don't bring my family into it. Mm-hmm. And I sort of touched him in the chair. He said, don't touch me. I said, I'll knock you over the bar to me. But up the stairs, my, my, my friend put me off. Go to the fight the next day. Frank Warren gave me tickets at the bleachers. But people knew how to see me. Once he started to recognize I was there, then boom. He broke me up and set me right behind Hamid Dad. And um, that whole night, the whole, during the whole fight, they sang, Way McCulloch, Way McCulloch. And it's on, on YouTube, you'll, you'll hear it. And Hamid fought like crap that night. And Medina stayed in there, but Hamid won the fight, but it was a tough fight for him that night. Never, never went back there after that. Mm. Don't come to somebody's country and... and and do that, but as I say, the fight with me and Hamid happened. He was never going to fight me. It happened because in '98, when I had the two fights back, because I was out of the ring from the sorry, it was a fight from '90 beginning of '97 until April of '98. Promoter problems, and my promoter didn't turn up for one of my fights, and um, promoter didn't turn, promoter didn't turn up for one of my fights because because we were having promoter problems, mm-hmm. and I fought a guy called um, I don't know, Juan Polo Perez. Former world champion, Hamid knocked him out in two rounds. I went in there. We did a ten rounder. looked like looked like crap. Won the fight. They gave me a split decision, but it was done. I was fighting in Corpus Christi with all Hispanic, and I won the fight clearly. But I wasn't. I didn't even care. I didn't even. My head wasn't there. I was going through the motions. Come back the next day. My wife gets a call from Hamid. He probably thought I was done because he knocked him out. I struggled t- 10 rounds, but he didn't know I was going to do problems in my head with motor. Mm-hmm. Got the call. Fight was done. I thought it was May of um, 98, and then the fight was done for October. And then they say that the atmosphere that night in Atlantic City was unbelievable. You know, the English, I met them on the boardwalk in the next couple of days before, getting pictures with me, and they all say, We're here to support you. Oh, like, fantastic. Irish the population up there in New York, Boston. Walking in that night, Michael Flatting walked me, walked me in that night. What a... Or dance to even. What? Michael Flatting could even dance to he got the He got the best footwork in the business. But Hamia had the best footwork that night. He was running the club. But as I say, the atmosphere that night was... It was like fighting back home. Mm-hmm. You know, if you watch it and turn it down and watch and score it yourself and then go to the end when they announced the decision, they fucking boot him. They boot him, you know, then they say, well, ah! you know, in America, how make was trying to get established here, but didn't realize I lived here. Mm-hmm. And there's over 30 million of Irish descent in this country. So I don't, and I say even the English guys would support me anyway. Scottish guys, Welsh guys. So don't come to America and think you're going to take over. <laughs> not not but the world. Never got the rematch with him and say, you know, I, I, I thought I, I didn't have to win the fight because you can't beat somebody. If somebody's run away, how can you win a round? 
but as I said, that didn't, it wasn't disappointing. The, the hotel I stayed in, it was a Tropicana Hotel, the manager guy, had a celebration party for me. You know, it was a great night. I would get up, I was fresh. A little mark on my eye, I was it. Nothing. And I'd say, how many never give me that mm. It would have been huge back home. England and Ireland would have been huge. It would have been like a Ricky Hatton fight, but he, he did. He thought I was done, give me the fight, and realized I wasn't done, so he didn't give me the rematch. <laughs> it's always the way it goes sometimes. You nearly, I guess, if you're sort of going back and you know, you go back in time, you'd whenever you're agreeing the first fight, you would obviously get the rematch sort of there as well, you know, whether you won yeah. or lose, you know, so that it ties it up. Um, you obviously mentioned your fight with Eric Morales as well. Um, you obviously moved back down, um, obviously to Super Bantam for that, but like when you look at your career, and obviously as as you'll get older, because you're still young now at, at 51, but as you get older, um, you know, in 70s and 80s, and you know, obviously you're telling yeah. your, your grandkids and stuff like that, you know, who, who you fought, you know, you can only you can only just be proud. I know, obviously, you sort of still the rawness where you think, well, it, well, it should have been three yeah. times, not one time, but, you know, Eric yeah. Morales, Prince Nassim, you know, yeah. you've accomplished as a boxer, you, you just have nothing but positivity out of it all. Well, so I want to leave. I want to leave my modern boxing. No matter who I fought, I gave everything I had. You know what I mean? And I wanted to give people exciting fights. And I think I think three quarters of my fights were exciting. You know what I mean? And um, the, like when you mentioned Olympics in Ireland, if you were about ten years old, maybe if you've got a good memory, of a little bit younger than that, maybe seven or eight, you remember the you remember the Olympics coming home to Dublin, fifty thousand people in the bus in the city centre in O'Connell Street. So you have people, other people. I'd say people in their 30s and 40s say, I remember we were here, we were here when you got that medal. So they remember where they were when the, when the medal came won. Mm. And that's something else. But nowadays it's all we McCulloch is like, you know, I'll be known to the next generation for the people will see my fights. As I say, people watch them fights, Morales Hamed, they'll watch them fights, they'll watch the Olympic fights, and then they'll realize who you are and they realize you're 60 years old or 70 years old. And you'll be remembered that way. And I think if I can leave, if my name can be remembered in boxing for forever, you know, that's a, not a bad thing. You know what I mean? Mm. And I say me having fought in a long time now, and people still talk about the Morales fight and the Hamid fight. You know, somebody the other night actually just said, "I watched your, I watched your fight with Morales today." I don't know who they were, but they actually said it to me. Yeah, I said thank. You. I don't. I, was, I just say thank you. And I say because Morales said he's top. Three toughest five. I was top three, number two or something. Mm. And coming from him, fantastic. You say the ninth round, he was ready to, he was ready to quit, which he would have. <laughs> I have been, but, it would be easy, easier for you if he had a quit. Or would it be when you get guys like that same thing they got and say, I would watch up once in a while? You know, you make a friend for life, you know what I mean? Like Casimir, you know, me and Morales are in touch. I haven't not in touch with my man because I don't that's social media I've tried to before and that, so I just left it. Mm -hmm. So something like Morales, you know, and um, Casimir are fine. Definitely is. You obviously my, um, my buddies, like Billy Walsh and stuff from the Irish team, Billy Eaton and stuff. Michael Cruz, I'm in touch with him. You know, Bernard Dunn, I, I would, and Carl and me would be in touch once in a while. You know, so I, I try to keep contact with people, you know what I mean? Because we've all did some in a small nation, but over here, you know, the Olympics just happen. You get. You get USA and, and China getting hundreds of medals. We get a couple of medals, we get four or something, and we're like, you know what I mean? So if you put that all in perspective, it's like you're over there, you think everybody know who you are quickly. Yeah, exactly. And I'd say it's whenever you do medal here, it's there's, there's more of a song and a dance made out of it rather than just being a oh, just celebrate for six months. <laughs> Definitely. Is. You you obviously had, had two years obviously out of fighting. Um you obviously um, weren't able to box. The British Boxing Board wouldn't give you a license. Um, you'd obviously assist in the brain. Was it sort of worrying, worrying and annoying times for you as a boxer, sort of going through all that? And obviously, I think then you, you fought in Nevada again, and then British Board were forced into giving you a license. But what was it? What was it like to go through and sort of having having obviously tough times like that, particularly with a health scare and stuff as well? It was it was terrible because the way they treated me was terrible. You know, I, I got, you know, I was clear. Every year you just scan over here to say you're clear. And then I go over there and I went there for like training camp, just train away. It, or I think it was eight days before that I get my scan, usual scan in the Royal Hospital. You know, 
18th, I think the fight was on the 20th of October. 18th of October, we're getting this, Mario's getting a call, we're getting a call from the promoter. And I'm gonna do my last workout just before the weigh-in for the next day. I was tired. And I said, tell him we'll call over on the way back. So we, we drove over to this gym. She walks in and I'm sitting in the car, walks out with the promoter. My daughter was, I think she was three or four of them. And they walk aside and says, more or less, your career's over, one more punch you can kill you. You can't fight this week. I'm like, what? I thought it was on kind of camera even, but mm-hmm. it was serious. And I'm like, what? So that, my wife, my husband just spent a lot of night and then I told my manager, found out he wasn't over yet. And he said, go get a second opinion, get a second opinion. Cause I hadn't seen the doctor's reports at this point. So we went to Dublin the day of the weigh-in. Got cleared by like the top doctors down there, three of them. Came back up with the clear reports. They wouldn't even look at it. Because their doctor who looked at, the doctor in, for the British sport wasn't even, like a GP. He wasn't even a, like a, a neurosurgeon or a neuro doctor or whatever. And then we went down to see the doctor who, who failed me. He wasn't a qualified doctor. He, he was one, that, he had to send to somebody to get their opinion. They seen some shadow or something. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't even, a, I'd say, it was crazy what they did. But I'd say, I went to the, went to the weigh-in, weigh it in. They let me weigh in. They let me weigh in. Called my way out, didn't fight. And then um, sold out arena, my first fight there in a while, sold out. I went to the fight and sort of apologized to the people, but then they did apologize. But let's say, I came back to America, Nevada board here, sent me to the best doctor in the country, UCLA. And they, they looked at me, did everything I had to do and said, it's an arachnoid space, it's not even a cyst. You were, uh, and, I, and we got scans from way back in the Royal Hospital in 93 when I turned pro. Mm-hmm. And the, what they seen in 2000 was there in 93, a little shadow. Mm-hmm. He's seen them, he said, it's been there your whole, your whole life, more or less. There's no danger to boxing. So I fought the British board for like, I could have said them, but I didn't. I fought their doctors, said their doctors had reports of the field. And then when I got their reports, their doctors 15 months later, their top doctor said I was clear to fight. And I'm still, I'm still to this day confused because mm-hmm. their doctors had cleared, it, cleared me, but they didn't look at it until like the 21st or 22nd of October. The fight was on the 20th. So they didn't even look at it before the fight. Mm-hmm. So I'm still to this day puzzled and what went on there. But somebody put a stop to it. And then I was accused by the certain promoter that, that I was a field of scam before I came over here. And I'm like, what? Do you think I do that? I said, do you think I do my father? I said, you call the you call Nevada's board over right now and ask them. Nevada, Nevada State Athletic Commission, one of the best commissions in the world. Mm. Their health, and the first thing they did to me, the Mark Ratner, who's the top guy at the time, before I even left Belfast, nothing from the British board, no scans from the British board for 15 months. Because I left here, Mark called me up and says, first and foremost, are you okay? Mm. As a person, I'm living in a different country, in a different city from my Belfast and they, I'm getting treated better here. You know what I mean? It's unfortunate. But he was he concerned about me, not about my career. I wasn't worried about my career. I was worried about me seeing my daughter wrong. But unfortunately I say, I didn't fight. I waited out for, I was at the ring 27 months total. And um, I put that behind me, got to fight in York Hall, Beth McGreen, got to fight in Belfast again, on the British, British roads. And um, didn't see anybody. I had a good, good guy on the British board, um, Robert, somebody, I think it was. He helped me. And the other guy was pushed out, pushed away. But I got to fight over the game, which I wanted to do. I got to fight for a world championship, which I lost. And I say I fought for two more world championships. So they, were, they could have put a stop to it, which they almost did. Because I believed that I was going to die with the the head, even though I got clearance from people. I still sort of... When somebody says something, you sort of believe it, normally. Mm-hmm. But as I say, I got help for that as well. I'm a Patrick doctor, and, and I get through it. And um, today, I just think about why. Because it was a, I was the number one contender. The fight in Belfast, my next fight was for the WBC belt, and we're all already um, gave up. Mm-hmm. I was going to be number one. I wasn't next fighting for the belt again. I wasn't going to fight on Morales this time. <laughs> <laughs> You're running away so, from him. So I fought. So I got. I would have been fine. I would have been champion, clearly. And we know that super bad. Then we abandoned it was my best division. It's featherweight. I was tall enough, but not big enough. You know what I mean? 
-hmm. but I still performed. I still performed, but the opportunities were there. But say, for some reason, British Border Control, I never got an apology from them. To this day, they never come up to me and said, I'm sorry. Did I need to hear it? No, I don't. But I think you should, as, as, as a British Border Control, should have even given me a letter, nothing. A common courtesy proved, just to apologize them, for the. I proved they were wrong, totally wrong. I could have set aside and just went away. And then, but I always, I always say, the truth always comes out. It might take one minute, it might take 100 years. It comes out somewhere. I might have been dead and buried, and some of my, my daughter's children made a find something that says that it's here. You know, so. Well, you sort of say, you know, you sort of thinking things happen in life. Obviously, moving to America and you think you weren't going to. Obviously, that 27 months of the ring as well, you probably could think back and go, what if, you know, if I was able to box in that time, you know, you, you could have been, you know, many more titles obviously added to the, the line there. And it just goes to show you sometimes that what's to be is to be and you sort of can't go back. But you no, just... I've, I've got, and say, I'm not going to rub throat on anybody. I've got good faith in God. I'm not a Bible basher. I believe in God. My faith got me through fights. My faith got me through a lot of things. But for them, 27 months I was out. I trained every day, twice a day. When I came back that year, I had three fights, one, one here in Vegas, one, one um, Bethnal Green in England, and one in Belfast. I knocked every guy out, three guys in a row. I came back with a bang. I came back to show that I'm not done. I came back to show... You know, it was almost like to me, you know, the British Board of Control fighting their, their thing twice, London and Belfast. I came back and knocked Guy out. And I, I, I was putting him a decent bonus. Mm -hmm. I just, just to the, make a point. Yeah, the point is, I've been training nonstop every single day for this opportunity that I've lost two years ago. And I say, I get the opportunity to say, it's a bad way again with Larius. That, you know, that, at that point in my career, it was in my prime. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was 30 I years think, old. Obviously, after the, the Scott Harrison and obviously Larry's fights, um, obviously they then, you know, I think it was three years later then you did your final fight. But you know, was it just did it just get to the stage obviously in the fights? I know obviously um it just got to the point where you just like just don't have it. Were you trying to <laughs> were you trying oh, to sort right. of <laughs> you're right, you're right that you have it. I did have it, but the point was injuries. Mm -hmm. The older you get injuries, you know, take longer to heal. And, you know, when I fought one race in the camera, I a fight I shouldn't even been there. I was then on the doctor's table. Week, but I don't make excuses. I extended my book um, chapter on Kindle, and that's when I put in what happened. I was then on the doctor's table week before I couldn't even move. My back was gone. And I called my promoter up at the time, saying, I can't go next week. I said, he's like, oh, yeah, you sold tickets and my blah, blah, blah. It's your last opportunity. And once he said that, I'm thinking, last opportunity. You know, instead of me thinking, fuck this. I went out there and fought a decent kid. Was winning the fight. I was undrugged up the eyeball. I was taking drugs. And I didn't mention it. I didn't take anything away from the kid afterwards. I didn't. It's for the NABA belt. And I had to stop. But if I wouldn't have stopped, I'd probably probably hurt myself. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that I was done. I'm glad I didn't get to see the point when I was done, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I had the injury. I was strapped up. My back was strapped up until I stepped out of the out of the dressing room. I took it off the strap, and I was drugged up. And um, I said, "I don't make excuses. I don't care. I lost a guy who was seventeen or four at the time. I don't care because it was for a minor belt, and it was still a tough enough fight. But I still, I was winning. Mm -hmm. I was winning the scorecards and three rounds to go or something. So, but I say." I think at that point I knew it was time. To, I was going. To, I was going. To, I was offered to fight in a prize fighter in 2010, injuries again, and that was more or less the end of it. No way. Yeah. It, but it got, I'm, I'm a tough guy. I didn't officially say to people I'm retired. I'm not going to be one of these guys who retired and then come back, retired and come back, retired. Conor McGregor four times. <laughs> but if I said I'm done, done. I think I think making the transition to training more or less tells that story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, without saying, I'm retired. Because if somebody asks me an exhibition match, it's an exhibition, I'll take it. Yep. But a real fight, no. If you give me a lot of money, maybe think about it, but it's not about the money. You know what I mean? It's not about the money. It's about mm -hmm. my health. I think my health's pretty, pretty good. And I want to keep it that way. 
and and it's, it's it's one of these things, I guess, when you know we see boxers, obviously they get to the stage where they where they go too far and they get seriously hurt and things like that. It's being able to make the right decisions at the right times rather than your help. Oh, yeah, the right decision. You're right. I said I say I'm, a set of fights because I did a bit of journalism. A set of fights, certain people not going to name names. I sat beside me and after seeing this tough fight, and I'm like, oh, you know, the guy took a lot of shots. And I, that one fight actually, that a kid died like the next day. Took a lot of punishment in the fight. Great which fight it was. And I had this journalist sit beside me, more or less, saying, you know, maybe it's time for you to retire. Maybe this and maybe that. This was back in like 2008 or, eight or nine or something. I just turned to him, put my own, put my own over him. First of all, the 27 months I was at the ring, I never heard from this guy. Mm-hmm. And then my friends are people I hear from who they'll say to you, do you have a carton of milk in the fridge? Do you have a loaf of bread? But this person got their hand around me more or less telling me what, what, what I'm going to do in my career because me and my wife can't make a decision. Mm-hmm. And I just said to him more or less, thanks for your concern, but you know, I think me and my wife can make a decision for ourselves. I don't need somebody like you telling me how to control my life. And he mm-hmm. always shit himself. And I get up and say, oh, okay, man. have I talked to that guy since? Probably 12 years ago, no. It's, so that's the type of people. I have friends who are friends, and I've got people who I see at the fights. Yeah, but there's people sometimes that, that make a relevance of knowing you for, for other for other games. Yeah, like, you know, you, you know, you me because he's a commentator around fights, commentator my fights. You know, that's how you see me, but you're not a doctor. And I just came back from. UCLA and get cleared to win. I, I went to UCLA. Dr. Neil Martin is the name of the guy. Mm-hmm. And he's one of the top doctors in, in the world now. And I've seen him as far back as a couple of years ago. Because I just wanted to make sure everything's good. Because yep. even when you get older, you can make things good. I did the Cleveland Clinic test, passed it twice, you know, for brain trauma, for football players, um, boxers. Mm-hmm. And um, I've cleared all that. So I just want to make sure I'm clear here because I'm 51. But I think you can have a long life ahead of me still. And I want to be healthy. Sure, making sure there's still brain cells in there, obviously, you know, we're taking so many punches sometimes and it's... Well, I think I told my wife when they found my brain, I think, I think it said it was this size. <laughs> and I was like, that's big, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, so you make a joke about that. See, most, a lot of fighters are unhealthy and, and don't live and they die in 60 or something. Exactly. And obviously it's making sure you look after yourself out of your box as well. Um, Obviously, um, since obviously you retired, you, you became yes, you became a UFC ambassador. How did that become? How did that come no, about? Dana White, Dana White's been my friend for a long time. He was at one of my fight parties after I won the, the championship here in Vegas, and he just he, I was at one of his fights in two thousand six. My brother in law was over, and he, I guess he gave me free tickets. And I sit at, like not on the floor, off the floor, and then I come over and I said thanks for the tickets. And he just said no, we want you to be part of the UFC. We want you to be part of the UFC. I'm like, what? So I came on board in 2007 and 2012 to get the media from boxing to come over because back then I did, the media of boxing wouldn't even consider it. Mm-hmm. And now, nowadays there's so many media there they, they turn them away. But I left the sport. I was at my first fight in 2004 when Chuck Adele Ortiz won. And then the, the, actually the Chuck Adele Ortiz 2 was what the fight was at the second time. So I loved the sport. I watched the ultimate fighter. I loved the UFC. I loved the fighting. Because at that point, when I joined the UFC, I got criticized so much from the boxing community. They hated me. I'm like, if it's a fight at the corner, I'm going to go and watch it. Mm-hmm. But now all the boxing people who criticize me are all leeching onto it. You know, but I love the sport and I say, you know, I love the way they fight and um, I do jujitsu and stuff. And I'd love to have a go at it myself, just like a friendly match. I know how to lock people up and choke them out or break their arm or break their leg. Without even punching them. <laughs> hey, obviously, when you were a boxer, you were able to punch people, knock them out. Now you can knock people out without punching oh. them. <laughs> Lock them up. Oh, let me out. It, but, but obviously, what, what you'd sort of say about the UFC is they sort of a model there of the best fight the best. And, and boxing, sometimes there's there's so many belts yeah. nowadays. I know the WBA has got a lot of stick recently because I think, oh, I think I've lost you there a second, Wayne. I don't know. That's what I'm saying with that. Something. Informant, so no, it's okay. You went. I've got about yep, five minutes. Still, still five here. I've got yep. about five minutes. Yeah, no problem. You're at the end of now. Um, no, you're right. The model is with the EFC. The EFC is one company, I understand they're one promotion, right? But they make the fight, best fight the best. That's why the belt changes hands so many times. It's not like somebody's got the belt for 20 years or 10 years. Boxing, there's too many promoters. 
but they won't work together. Mm -hmm. If they work together, they can put the best fight together. Like Josh and Fury, they're trying to do that fight, pushed away, pushed away. Get all the four belts together. You used to have one belt, you know. Boxing used to have one belt back in the day, eight divisions, and that's so many different belts. And until they work together, it's never going to be the way UFC does it. We obviously know we're pushed for time and stuff here as well, obviously, because we know you're, you're going to the fights tonight. Um, what does the future hold for, for Wayne McCulloch? Obviously, I know um, after COVID, back to normal, you're going to have Dennis Hogan um, over with the yeah. obviously Laurie and, and a few other fighters there as well. What does the future hold? And, you know, what's your aspirations now as a, as a, as a trainer? I want to be, I say, I want to be a city or I want to be a good teacher of boxing. Eddie taught me well. I want to be, if I can be as, as close to him, as, as he was, like unbelievable. I say, I've got, if Dennis Hogan he wants to come over here, um, I've got Larry Fry's. I always talk about having an Irish camp, all the Irish fighters. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I've got, I've got Scott Alexander, a big, um, tall, six foot three black guy. He's freaking fight like crazy. He's fighting probably next month. He's here. Danny Keaton from back home. He's 4 0 as a pro. Mm-hmm. Hoping to get him over. And uh, I've reached, I've talked to like, like people before, Cam and all them guys. And I would love to have had Kitty Taylor and stuff. Kelly, Kelly Harrington, well, hello. <laughs> you know, so I'm not, you know, I understand they have different promoters, managers, but I'm a coach. Coaches are individual. Mm-hmm. We're not locked with other promoters, no I mean. We can, we can train somebody who's fighting with Don King, Bob Arm, Eddie Hearn. We can train if we want to. But I think, I think my calling is training people. Because, mm-hmm. and obviously, you know, getting them to achieve their dreams is what you've achieved in your dreams. Well, let's say I, don't, I never, I'm, I'm like you said at the start, I don't bring myself to it. Mm. But I just say, you know what? I know it's like to deep water in the fight. I know it's like to think, if you think, don't, don't take a fight lightly. So I can teach them that. And they, and they love that. They love that. And they learn. And they, you know, if somebody want to learn, I just say, don't want to train you. But the guy, people I have now, they want to learn and, and say, hopefully they're successful. And, and I'm sure, obviously, Irish fight fans would obviously love to see you back. You know, we're obviously have loved him in Magnitude or SSE Arena, and um, and obviously you there with a fighter in a corner. You know, for obviously it's any fight happen. fans, it will happen. It will happen. I, I know that sometimes when you're away in America, sometimes you probably don't realize probably how popular you still are in Belfast. You know, I'm sure there's loads of fighters out there in and fans that, that obviously want to want to meet the Hall of Fame fighter and the Irish <laughs> legend they are. You know, I think if I walk <laughs> no, if I can have the impact on people, you know, a role model for people, say Carl, you know, I'm Carl's hero and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to him and thankful. And I say the media tried to stir things up a few years ago, it's a little bit garbage, but mm-hmm. they try to do that. You know what I mean? You see one thing and then they, shoo. me and Carl sat face to face here and had a coffee together when he was over here. So we, we talked, we know what the media is like. The media, they criticize Carl when he loses, you know what I mean? Yep. They're, so, they're your best friend when you win and they're, and they're your enemy when you lose. Yeah, they, they bring up, and I say, Card's a legend to me as well. I was a fan of his too. So I just want to, you know, we have the very few people who make it over there, so support each other. Mm. Don't be jealous, support each other. We're such a small nation who produces world champion. You know, just get behind each other and um, just support each other in the um, Protestant Catholic, whatever. Get behind them. Definitely is. When um, obviously, I always say it's always an absolute pleasure to have people on. <laughs> but um, obviously, your first world champion box with on, and obviously, what a, what a statement we made, and obviously having yourself on. Um, well, I did, I did, I did have part of Alex Arthur from Scotland. I trained Alex in two thousand six and seven, and he came to the Bureau Super Featherweight Champion. Mm-hmm. So technically, my first world champion on me. It's, get, it's yeah. getting the multiple, multiple yeah. ones. Part, next. part of it, I was part of his. I was in the corner when he beat Ricky Burns. Mm-hmm. He beat Ricky. Beat Ricky he beat Ricky Burns. He was a three-time world champion in the end. I was in his corner that night when he had to dig deep and win, and he did it. And um, Alex Arthur was a great, great friend of mine right to this day. And um, he's going to send. He's going to send his son over to train with me soon. <laughs> but he was really my fun, doesn't it? My first real. He was my first pro I trained, and he became world champion. It's not bad to get your first and become world champion, is it? <laughs> definitely not. It definitely shows it's not it's not luck. You know, sometimes I just want to say luck. thanks to all the fans and all the people and all the all the people who, who don't really know me now. They may they might know me from twelve from 2012 when I carried the, the, the torch. torch. <laughs> well. 
you know, mine's such a good impact as well. Because I went, remember going to a little primary school over there and did something for them. So they're probably thinking, oh, that's what the guy, he's a boxer. So, you know, social media is the way to go, YouTube. Yeah. And to say, I would love to have won a world championship when my daughter was, was, was born. And I, I, I say, I thought I did a few times because she was born. And then, unfortunately, I was robbed, but a journalist says I wasn't. <laughs> but but thank you. I also want to thank you as well for um, taking over our Instagram the other week as well. I'm sure we'll, we'll hopefully get you on again. Time. You know, I'll take it over. You get my daughter. She's more popular than me. Get her. Take it over. Get and her I'll on the swinging. I could be in the background. You see? See? <laughs> Good mind. Thank you. But but thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Thank you so much. Cheers, Wayne. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.